All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us for the Ultron Lecture Series today. Uh, we are pretty excited that we're kind of getting towards the end of the semester, uh, but we still have a lot of interesting topics and a lot of good things to talk about. Uh, but today, we're going to do a little bit of a throwback to pulmonary ultrasound. You know, we talked about it earlier in the year, but we're going to talk about it again. We have Greg Stoner, our current fellow, who's going to be presenting to us about lung ultrasound. So without taking too much time, Greg, go ahead and take it away, and let's hear what you have to say. So we're going to start things off with a case. So we have a 76-year-old female coming into the emergency department, feeling short of breath. Um, she's afebrile, got a little tachycardia. You can see a little tachypnea as well. Um, she appears to be in respiratory distress. She's got increased work of breathing. She's using some accessory muscles. She's really only able to speak in one to two word answers. So you're not going to get too much history out of this patient. Um, so you're going to ask yourself, okay, should I, should I go ahead and page radiology and they can come by with the portable chest x-ray and, and maybe they'll be there in two minutes if you have a perfect hospital, but there'll probably be a few minutes uh, until they're going to come by, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And this, this patient is in respiratory distress. Um, she's saturating okay, but you know, she's got increased work of breathing. You're worried about that. Um, so you're going to decide, hey, maybe I want to grab that ultrasound machine. Um, so you say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get that. Obviously, this is an ultrasound lecture. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to grab that ultrasound machine. Um, and then you're going to say, okay, well, you know, why should I use it, right? Well, for multiple reasons, okay? First of all, a uh, chest x-ray is, is good, but it's not perfect uh, for picking up a lot of different things, okay? Um, you know, and ultrasound has a higher sensitivity for detecting pneumothorax. It's really, 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 really good for pneumothorax. Much, much better than a chest x-ray. Um, and it's very, very sensitive for that. And it can be very specific as well, which we can get into a bit later with the lung point sign is going to be very specific for that pneumothorax. Um, and of course, we have one of the big topics we're going to talk about today is called the blue protocol. Um, so that is something that kind of helps you to figure out in undifferentiated shortness of breath what you might be dealing with. Um, so it helps you kind of go through some things. You're going to rule out pneumothorax, going to look for lung sliding. I'm going to take a look at the actual lung parenchyma if you're able to. Um, although a lot of ultrasound in the lung is artifact based. Um, so we kind of go off of, okay, we usually don't see very much because there's air, but if the lung gets condensed, then we start to see things. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we do a lot of ultrasound in, for lung is, is with the artifacts. Uh, but there's a really wonderful protocol called the blue protocol. And that was created to help you kind of go through um, looking at the lung and the undifferentiated patient so you can determine, you know, is this a pneumothorax? Is this a pneumonia? Is there, you know, uh, pulmonary effusion? Is there, um, you know, ARDS or something else? You know, is there something in, in the interstitium of the actual lung tissue? Um, is there a pulmonary embolism? You know, um, you can't necessarily get a 100% answer but it can certainly help lead you down those pathways. And it's gonna be really important, I think, you know, and, and again, which I, I think, you know, ultrasound, you can do this so quickly at the bedside, you know, you can do it in just a few minutes. It can take you three, four minutes, um, you know, faster than you're gonna be able to get that chest X-ray. And you can get some information, especially in those patients that can't really talk to you much because they're in, in respiratory distress. You wanna try to figure out what's going on. So you can make those medical decisions quickly, um, help your patients out. Uh, so gonna go ahead and, and talk a little bit about the limitations. Obviously um, it's not gonna pick up everything. Um, one of the biggest limitations of pulmonary ultrasound is that it's operator dependent. Um, so I definitely recommend grabbing that probe, um, you know, going out there and scanning some patients and getting used to, to what, you know, things look like, right? So, you're, so you have that experience when you go to, uh, you know, use it on the patient that is in respiratory distress, right? So go scan some normal lungs, um, just get used to kind of how the anatomy appears, right? Because um, if you don't have any experience or you miss something, um, it's really going to be, you know, it's not gonna be good, right? You're gonna miss that. So that's why, it, you know, the, the way lung ultrasound works is you're only gonna see that small glimpse, right? So you gotta make sure that you, you scan all of the entirety of the lung, right? Um, so you can find that, that pathology, right? Um, so it, it's very much operator dependent. And like I said earlier, it's artifact based, right? So, um, you know, it, it can help lead you down pathways. It doesn't always give you an exact diagnosis of what's going on. Um, now, of course, with the blue protocol, you know, you, you can get kind of ideas. Again, um, you can certainly rule out, you can rule out a pneumothorax. Uh, if you scan all the lungs, look for that lung sliding, you can rule that out, no problem. But you can't always get a perfect answer. Um, now, and if you spent, you know, 20 minutes doing comprehensive ultrasound, you know, that's going to take up a lot of time, right? Um, but the quick cursory exams um, will give you a good amount of information in a, in a short amount of time that can help you with your clinical decision, which is exactly what we want, right? So we're going to take a little bit 
uh, talk about the physics of ultrasound. I know it's not the most fun topic, but it's something important to understand when you're talking about the lungs. Um, because air, as you can see here, the, the ultrasound waves don't really travel very well through air. Okay. Um, and what that means is that there's not a lot of information that can be received back because uh, the probe is going to emit those sound waves, right? And then it's going to listen for the sound waves to come back, right? And one of the big things that is present in lung ultrasound is the difference between tissues, okay? So the lung itself is going to be filled with air, right? It's not going to transmit a lot of those ultrasound waves, but the pleura, right? It's going to be that soft tissue, right? So you're going to have this, this huge contrast between the air and the soft tissue. You go from 330 to 1540, right? Um, you can see bone all the way down there, right? Sound waves don't really go through bone very well. All right. Um, so you're going to, you're going to see the pleural interface very nicely. And that's going to be where we're looking when we're, when we're checking out those lungs with ultrasound, we're really looking at the pleural interface, um, because that's what we're able to see, right? That's the, that's the portion of the lung. That's the most superficial, um, it's going to be interacting with the soft tissues and it's going to provide you that interface to give you a little bit of a window into the lung. Um, so just kind of thinking about, you know, why it is that we're seeing that, um, a little bit backstory. Um, yeah, again, uh, here's again, showing that picture. You can see here, um, you know, that bright white line that you're going to see, that is the pleura on the lung, right? So the lung parenchyma itself, you're not really going to be able to visualize in a normal lung, but because of the change in tissue, right? Because you have the change in frequency between the air and the soft tissue, it's going to create it's going to accentuate that difference basically. And that's why the, the pleura appears so bright, um, you know, it creates this acoustic impedance and it makes it so this, it gets bounced off. Uh, the sound waves get bounced off and it lights up really nicely. It makes it really easy to see uh, the pleura. So uh, now, like I said, the pulmonary conditions that we're going to be looking at, um, they're going to have to be next to the pleura, right? In order for us to see it. Fortunately, most pulmonary conditions are in this area. So that's, that's helpful for us in, in trying to figure out What's going on? So you're going to grab that machine. You're going to say, okay, well, what, what should I do? Right. Should I, should I, you know, grab the linear probe? Should I grab the curvilinear? Um, well, I'd, I'd say you probably want to go for both of these um, depending on what you're looking for. Right. So the linear probe is going to be that high frequency probe. Um, it's going to be very, very good for looking at superficial structures, which is generally what we're doing when we're looking at the lung. We're looking at those uh, and we're looking at the pleura. We're looking for lung sliding. We're looking for things that are close uh, to the skin surface. So the linear is going to give you a lot more tissue definition. Uh, and it's going to be really good for that. It's the go-to probe when you're looking for anything superficial. Uh, if you're concerned about something deeper in the lung, or you want to get a little bit, you know, larger view, say you're looking in the bottom of the lungs and you want to evaluate for, you know, fluid, you want to see if there's a, you know, an effusion there and you, you can go for that curvilinear probe, you're going to get a lot wider view uh, you can see the diaphragm, you can see, you know, into the abdomen, it gives you a little bit more information, you know, kind of clinically what's going on with the patient. Um, again, it's not going to be as good for those superficial structures. In a pinch, can you get away with it? Sure, you're going to see the pleura, but it's not going to be quite as crisp as that linear probe. But I'd say it depends on what you're looking for. Um, but you'll probably want to use both probes, but you'd probably want to start with the linear probe. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to grab that linear probe. And then we're going to start talking about the blue protocol. Um, so the first thing you want to determine when you're looking at the lungs is whether there's lung sliding, because that's going to tell you if there's a pneumothorax or not, uh, which is obviously very important because uh, you'll need to, you know, know if you need to put a chest tube in or something like that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cause of, you know, hypoxia that you can identify right away. Um, and it's easy to do. You're going to want that linear probe for that. Right. So you're going to step one is to grab that linear probe and look to see if you have any lung sliding. Right now, there's obviously a couple pathways we can go down. We'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but you're going to look for that lung slide. So how are you going to do that, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to put the probe in between two rib spaces, okay? And you're going to want to use M mode. So M mode is going to detect tissue movement. And so lung uh, is going to move, right? Uh, as you breathe, that pleura is going to, the parenchymal and uh, the visceral and parietal pleura are going to slide across each other. That's going to create movement, which is going to show up on M mode when you're looking at an ultrasound. So you can use that to your advantage to see if there are lung sliding or not. Because sometimes it can be a little bit complicated, especially on the left side, because uh, the heart's going to be moving, right? So some of those tissues can be moving. Um, so you got to just, you know, 
keep that in mind. Um, you know, what exactly, what type of motion you're seeing again, if you're seeing a rhythmic motion, it's probably due to the heart. If you're in the left lung, um, and MO is going to help you kind of to evaluate that. Um, so what you're going to do is when you click the M mode button, you're going to see a little dot. You're going to see a line. You're going to see a dot. You want to place that dot over the plural. And then the machine's going to really focus in on that area. And it's going to show you if there's mo motion or not, right? So you can see on the left side here in the normal lung, um, everything that is on the top portion of that picture is not moving. So that's why there's just, you know, basically straight black lines there because you know, normal tissue, the, the subcutaneous tissue is not going to be moving, right? So uh, that's not going to show any motion. And so you're going to see these straight lines uh, on the M mode, right? And then you look below that. What you're going to see there is motion, right? You see there's a bright white line uh, and there's kind of a distinct change there. And that represents the motion of the pleura sliding across each other. So that's good. That's what you want to see in a normal lung. If you look on the right side, you can see that that kind of, appearance that you see in the top part of the screen kind of continues down into the bottom part of the screen. And that's what we call the barcode sign. Um, so it, again, uh, grabbing that linear probe, sticking it in M mode is a really great way for you to get a quick answer. You can find out, evaluate for normothorax in, in 10 seconds. Uh, it's very, very fast. And, and, and most people can immediately recognize, okay, does it look like a barcode or does it look more like a seashore, right? On the left side, you can see that there's a really distinct line there's a really big difference between the upper portion of the picture and the bottom portion because well the lung's sliding right uh, whereas on the right side it's not moving so it's going to continue that you know absence of movement and that's going to be your barcode sign right uh, and that's going to be positive for pneumothorax right um, so we're going to dive into the blue protocol now so what does it stand for well, it stands for bedside lung ultrasound examination pretty straightforward right um so what you're going to do in this particular situation um let's say we don't see any lung sliding, right? Okay. So now we have to figure out, you know, is this because of a pneumothorax, which is the most likely reason, right? Or you can sometimes see absence of lung sliding in, you know, severe pneumonia or other a process going on inside the lung, right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look to determine if there's an A profile or a B profile. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about more about what that means, right? So, so what those profiles mean is, whether there's a predominance of what we call A lines or B lines. We'll start with A lines. Um, so A lines are going to be a reverberation artifact. Again, remember that difference in the tissue between the soft tissue and the pleura and create that reverberation, right? That's going to give you that bright white line, right? Because it, it kind of, you know, it reverberates and messes with those sound waves a little bit. And what that's going to do is scatter some of those beams. Um, and as a result, you know, much like in, in music, when you get harmonics, when you play a note, there's actually multiple instances of that note. You can't always hear them, um, but they do exist, right? So what happens is those sound waves get repeated again. Um, and so you can see artifacts that look like additional pleural lines. And those are normal uh, findings, right? Again, A lines, B lines are all normal. It's dependent on how much of them you see. Um, and again, what the clinical scenario is, right? Um, so what it tells you is that there's air in the lung, right? Because that air is going to create that reverberation artifact. And you're going to see, you know, multiple A lines coming down. That's going to look exactly like multiple pleuras, right? So that's, um, again, a normal finding. Um, and so you want to look and see, again, are you having lung sliding or not? And that's kind of your most important thing. That, and that's just why the first thing you do in the blue protocol is look for the lung sliding, right? So if you see an A profile and you see lung sliding, then you know there's not a pneumothorax, right? Um, if you see no lung sliding in an A profile, well, then it's probably a pneumothorax, right? Um, so then what you want to do next is you want to look for what's called the lung point sign. So the lung point sign is the most specific thing. Oh, uh, I guess this gives, oh, there it is. It's playing. Okay. So um, the lung point sign is the most specific way for you to diagnose a pneumothorax with ultrasound. It is hundred percent. You see it, you know, you got it, right? So what, what that basically means, you can see on the CAT scan here on the left, right? You can see it's a pocket of air, right? There's a pneumothorax. And then, you know, most pneumothoraces, unless they surround the entirety of the lung, there's going to be portions of the lung that are sliding, right? Where, where the lung has not been collapsed, right? So that's going to create lung sliding, right? And the areas where the pleura is not touching, there's not going to be lung sliding, right? If you can find that exact location where there is lung sliding and then there's not lung sliding, 
that's called the lung point sign. So you can see in, on the right, you can see lung sliding up to a point. It almost like looks like it's smacking up against the wall. And it basically is. I mean, that, that's normal lung sliding. And then, oh, it hits the point where it's not able to slide anymore. And then uh, that tells you that's, that's called the lung point sign. And if you see that, that basically is kind of like a map almost like you can really almost like think in your head, like if there's a CT of this patient's chest, right? Because if you scan and you say, okay, I, I see a lung point sign here, and then I'm going to continue to map it out and follow it. Um, and again, thinking about where you'd see that, right? So in a, in a you trauma patient who's supine, that air is going to, you know, rise anteriorly, right? So you're going to look more in the anterior chest. Patient who's sitting upright, you know, maybe you see the medical side, you want to look at the apices of the lung, right? Because that's where the air is going to go. Um, so you want to check those areas out first, because uh, that's where the air is going to rise up to, right? And if you see that lung point sign, that tells you that's the point where the lung is now meeting the pleura. Um, so it helps, you know, diagnose the pneumothorax for certain, and it also could be useful in mapping out the size of the pneumothorax, right? Because you can um, you can see no lung sliding, no lung sliding, oh, there's a lung point sign, and now there's lung sliding beneath it. And you can say, oh, it's a very small pneumothorax, or, oh, it's a very large one, we need to put a chest tube in. Uh, it can really give you a lot of useful information. Like I said, um, what you want to do when you're scanning the lung is think of like a zipper, right? So think about um, sliding, you know, up and down. Um, traditionally, I'd recommend the longitudinal uh, technique. Transverse can be a little bit harder because you have to deal with those ribs. Uh, you might need to angle your probe a bit to get between them. It's easier to go into the sagittal plane uh, and do the longitudinal scan and just think of like vertical zippers, right? So you want to go down, go next to the um, costochondral junction, right? So that's going to uh, a lot of cartilage there, actually. It's e a little bit easier to get the sound waves through some of the ribs where they meet the sternum. Um, and so you may not get quite as much shadowing. You can get a little bit better visualization of the pleura uh, in those locations, right? So you're going to scan down that, and then you're going to go back up, start it superiorly, move your way back down, and just keep kind of repeating in a zipper-like pattern as you move your way across the whole chest, right? And that's, the, that's how you're going to scan the entirety of the lung, right? If you want to 100% roll out you know, a condition or you want to assess for something specific you might be looking for. Again, um, when you're doing those cursory examinations, patient supine, trauma, you want to roll out, you know, what are you looking for? You're looking for a clinically significant pneumothorax, right? So if you have, patient has a tiny pneumothorax, you know, you're probably not putting a chest tube in, right? So in those cursory examinations where you don't have as much time, you can stick with something a little bit simpler, a little easier, just do, you know, one quick scan down the middle close to the maneuverium, right? Because again, that's going to be where the air is going to rise, uh, you're most likely to see it. And if a patient has a large pneumothorax, probably not going to miss it if you do that. But if you're looking for comprehensive scan, you're going to want to go basically zippered in layers, right? Um, so patient came in, short of breath, grabbed the linear probe. You saw there's no lung sliding. And you decided, you know what? We're going to put a chest tube in this patient. Of course, right? Got to put the chest tube in. Got to get some analgesia, right? So maybe you grab your, grab your pivot cane. You do a little uh, serratus anterior block. Uh, give the patient some good analgesia, uh, put the chest tube in, no problems, uh, made the diagnosis, save the patient. Good job, right? Happy patient, happy provider. Case number two, 82 year old guy comes in this time. Again, short of breath. This time he's got a little bit of a fever, a little tachycardic, a little tachypnic. Um, he said, you know what? I've been coughing for a couple of days, coughing up uh, some yellow sputum. Right? Uh, you know, maybe thinking pneumonia, I don't know, right? Looks like he's not having some a uh, good time here. He's having some trouble breathing, right? So we're going to go back to that blue protocol again, right? Um, again, this time we're going to take a look for those lung sliding. Okay. Now we see in this patient, we see the barcode sign again. Okay. Well, is this a pneumothorax? Uh, well, we got to, again, look for those A profile versus B profile, right? So you take a look here and you say, hmm, what's that, right? These are called B lines, right? Um, and I'll explain what those are. All right, so what B lines are, are basically a normal artifact. Um, so uh, normally you're going to see about two or less per intercostal space in a normal lung tissue, right? Again, this is just a form of a reverberation artifact. kind of looks like a common tail, uh, again, extending vertically uh, away from the probe. Um, again, normal finding, again, depends on the number you're seeing, right? And that's And that's where, you know, Again, it's kind of operator dependent how you're looking and, and viewing and things. Um, so make sure you're, you're looking at each individual intercostal space, right? Because if someone has a focal pneumonia, 
and you're not scanning that particular area, you might miss it, right? Um, so if you're seeing a bunch of B lines, you know, like we saw in the previous example, I mean, look at the picture in the right, right? We see one, two, three, four, five, right? That's that's not normal. That's abnormal, right? So if you see a lot of B lines all over the place, um, that would be more likely to be from pulmonary edema, right? Because again, it depends on where in the lung field you're scanning and how many you're seeing, right? So if you're seeing a lot of them and you're seeing them all over the entirety of, you know, the right side of the chest, and, you know, it's probably unlikely that the patient has a diffuse pneumonia, right? But they're more likely to have something like pulmonary edema uh, that's going to create additional artifacts, right? So again, you have to kind of use the scan and the clinical picture in context. Um, again, that guy, he had fever, right? So fever, he's tachycardic, he's short of breath. You know, we see B profile, maybe we're thinking pneumonia, right? Because he didn't have any lung sliding, right? Um, case number three. The guy comes in, um, go ahead and throw the probe on there. You got some lung sliding. That's good, right? So now you want to look to see if there's an A profile or B profile. This particular patient happens to have an A profile. So now you have to go down to the lower part of the pathway, right? Because you're now concerned about something like a PE, right? Because basically what we've what this patient has is a normal appearing lung ultrasound right? But they're short of breath, right? So why are they short of breath? Okay. So now we have to jump down to this lower section. And as part of the blue protocol, we're going to actually check the legs to see if there's any DVT, uh, right? Because again, most P's are going to come from DVTs, right? Um, so you're going to grab the HD11, you're going to head into the patient's room uh, and you take a look and you, know, you look to see if there's any DVT there, right? Uh, as you can see, there is no DVT there. Veins easily compressible. So now we're going to move on to stage three. Okay. And we're going to go to what is called the PLAPS point. So what does that stand for? Well, it's called the posterior lateral alveolar and or pleural syndrome, which sounds complicated. And if you look on the left, the original protocol says you use your palms on the patient's chest. Um, I've never done that. It's, it would be an awkward thing to do. Um, so again, generally speaking, it's going to be around the level of the nipple. Okay. So you go around the level of the nipple, you come onto the posterior axillary line, right? And that is going to give you a view, right? Into the lungs of that location. Okay. And, and the reason we go to this location is because this is a common place where you're going to see uh, changes in the lung, right? Um, so you slap your probe on here. Again, I'd probably recommend going with your curvilinear here because again, we're looking at deeper structures, right? So we've, we said, okay, we've used the, we've used the linear probe. We've got lung sliding. We uh, we've got an A profile, so we don't see a bunch of, you know, B lines that would suggest pulmonary edema. So we look at, we look on the legs, we don't see any blood clot. So now we say, okay, let's take a further look inside the lung, right? So we come here um, on the patient side here, right? We look inside to see if we're seeing any lung pathology, right? Because now we're saying, okay, this patient might have some actual changes to the lung parenchyma. Because again, normally lungs are going to be filled with air. We're not going to see a lot, but when there's pathology, when there's, you know, inflammation, when there's edema, when there's consolidation, now all of a sudden we can see the, the lung, right? And you can see on the left side here, it almost looks like the patient has an extra liver, right? So as the lung gets more consolidated, right, it becomes more solid, right? And it's, it's less aerated. Um, and certainly if, if it, there's not getting good aeration to that, you know, area, if there's a shunt or something like that, um, then that lung is going to become consolidated and it's now going to be visible in ultrasound, right? Um, as you can see uh, on the left side, like I said, um, things are really consolidated. On the right side, um, you're going to see what's called kind of the shred sign, right? So as the lung gets consolidated, something like a pneumonia, you know, focal change in that area, it's going to create those, you know, inflammatory cytokines, all that good stuff. That's going to create edema. It's going to create changes and in inflammation, and that's going to show up on ultrasound. Right. And again, putting that in the clinical picture, right. Uh, is this in a focal area, right. Or is this consolidation at the bottom of the lung? Cause there's a bunch of fluid around it. Well, that would explain the consolidation. Right. Uh, so it depends on, you know, where you're looking um, and, and what it is that you're trying to find. And again, that clinical picture, right. Uh, talk a little bit about some additional applications you can use it for. Right. Um, so say you have patient, um, you know, with, a bunch of diffuse B lines, right? Now that could be suggestive of, you know, pulmonary edema or decompensated heart failure, but you can also see that in something like ARDS, right? So that's when you might want to, you know, get some labs, 
right? Get a pro BMP. Um, yeah, pro BMP is really great when it's negative, right? So if it's if it's less than 100, you can pretty much say it's probably not CHF, right? So if 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 your patient has a diffuse B line pattern and their pro BMP is normal, then it's probably not heart failure, right? Um, so again, ARDS is going to usually affect that pleural interface and the subpleural parenchyma, right? A little bit different than some of the other interstitial syndromes, right? So you might see um, some irregular or, or fragmented pleural lines, right? You can get some pleural thickening. Okay. And again, that's why it's important to do a lot of these scans so that you can recognize what a normal pleural thickness is. You know, then when you see something that's a little thicker, you say, oh, maybe that looks a little bit thickened, right? Again, um, you know, looking for those things because uh, most of these applications are going to be at that pleural interface, right? Um, so in ARDS, you're going to have some of those inflammatory changes there. Um, but again, you might have areas that are completely spared. Um, you might have areas where there's lung sliding affecting. Um, ARDS can be obviously a very significant illness for patients, um, and it can have a lot of different findings on ultrasound as well. Um, you can also use this in kids as well. Um, if you have a little baby that comes in, uh, you could have the transient tachypnea in the newborn. You can get something called the double lung point sign, which is a really interesting finding, where you'll see lung sliding, you see a lung point sign, and then on the other side of the same window, you'll see lung sliding. Um, so this is kind of uh, specific, very, very sensitive, 100% specific, highly sensitive for diagnosing that uh, transient tachypnea. So if you find yourself in, you know, looking at those neonates, this could be something good to help you to, to say, okay, well, this is just your transient tachypnea. Um, you know, if you see that, you're like, okay, this is what this is. It's, you know, it's 100% specific, right? So then you don't necessarily have to be worried about something else going on with the patient if you're seeing this uh, the particular finding. Um, although we don't scan a lot of neonates in the ED, but uh, it is an ultrasound application. So felt like I would mention it. And uh, that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, any additional questions about anything? <laughs>